Section E, getting feedback toward revision. After you got a draft, then you can meditate on what you've done. You can look around and figure out where you've gone with your writing. Now is the time to be more critical of what you've written. You want to read what you wrote and ask yourself, what in the world was I thinking when I wrote that? We'll call writing at this stage considered writing. Hmm. Considered writing is a bit more purposeful and controlled than either free writing or exploratory writing. You want to use the ideas you came up with in free writing and exploratory writing to begin to bring your paper to maturity and out of that awkward acne stage. You need to think about the assumptions that underlie your writing. Think about how someone else would look at your paper. A good way to do all these things is to get some feedback from a classmate, a teacher, or someone at the writing center of your school. Getting feedback simply means having someone else respond to particular parts of your paper. Feedback. Feedback. I love feedback. What do you think of my eyes? That's a beautiful shade of yellow your head is. Oh, thank you ever so much. You must tell me, how does your head stay so green? I rub broccoli all over it, all day long. Now, many English composition classes require that you get feedback at certain times. They may require you to get some feedback from people in your class or from your teacher, but very few other college courses require you to get feedback on your assignments. It's all up to you to do that. So for the next few minutes, we're going to look at why you should get feedback and how to get good feedback for your papers. Feedback is exactly what you need after you've got a draft in hand. As writers, we need to find out what's going on with our readers as they read our stuff. Remember, we want our readers to think and feel what we want them to, when we want them to. As we said earlier, one of the reasons we write is to manipulate our audience in some way. It would help us to hook up little cameras into our readers and see all the thoughts, images, feelings, and impulses that occur as they read our writing. That way we would know if we had them right where we want them. So, some of what you're looking for from your readers is just their initial reactions to your writing, but you also want specific feedback on particular aspects of your writing. So how do you get this kind of feedback? Psychic phone calls? Nope. You get good feedback from others by asking good questions. If you just ask your reader, what do you think of my draft, you're likely to get a response like this. Well, it's, it's pretty good. It's, I mean, it's fine. It's got, you know, stuff words in it. It's, it's typed. And you don't want a response like that because it doesn't help you at all. So when you take your paper to someone to read, you need to have a list of questions you have about it prepared. That way, they'll know what to look for when they're reading your paper and can give specific feedback. I wish I had some feedback. Your haircut repulses me. <laughs> Is it really that bad? Now, what kinds of question you ask your reader depends upon the paper, the reader, and what stage of the writing process you're at. Before we look at Nathan's list of questions for his reader, we need to say one more thing about getting feedback. It's important to pick the right person to read your paper. So that cowboy who works at the barbecue house probably isn't your best bet. You want to pick someone who would be a good critic of what you're writing about. It might be really easy for Nathan to pick his parents. But they wouldn't be as thoughtful observers of high school life as someone his own age would be. Since this is just his first draft, he's going to focus on larger issues in his paper. Remember, you work on large matters like your thesis statement, organization, and world peace early in the writing process. You save the smaller stuff like sentence structure, language, grammar, and cleaning out the cat litter box for the end of the writing process. Here are the questions Nathan came up with. Are the ideas I have effectively arranged and expressed? Do I stick to my thesis throughout the paper? Is the paper easy to follow? Are the main ideas developed and supported with proper details? Does my paper fit the intended audience? And does the paper complement my agile mind and manly physique. Nathan takes his paper and his list of questions to Sam in his class. So what do you think of Nathan? Oh, Nathan's a cutie, yeah. 
Let's look at some of the comments Sam had about Nathan's paper. Remember, the paper she has commented on is paper number one of your insert cards. Changes made to this paper will be in paper number two. Her first comment is about the opening paragraph. Right now, the opening reads, groups. They're everywhere. You see them on the street and in people's houses. Separation through grouping manifests itself in countless places, but it seems as though high school is the place where cliques and groups are most common. Sam's marked that the opening could be more specific and interesting, and that the introduction could be spiced up more. She also questions his statement, high school is the place where cliques and groups are most common. She thinks groups outside of high school are just as common as groups in high school. So the opening of Nathan's paper needs some work. Let's talk about openings for a second. You want your opening to do two things. You want your opening to get your reader interested in the subject of your paper and to show the reader the focus of your paper. You use the rest of the opening to develop your focus for the paper and lead into the thesis. There is no exact way to begin a paper. As we said at the beginning of the tape, it depends upon the field of study you're writing for and what the assignment asks. But there are some methods you can use. Um, excuse me, Professor. I'm having a little bit of trouble with my opening. It's kind of dull. And, uh... Come on, kid. Your opening needs to take your reader in. There's lots of ways to do it. Tell them an anecdote. Ask them a question. Give them a direct quotation. A definition. A description. I don't care. Whatever you think works. But you need to wow them. Slam! Bang! They won't know what hit them. First with a right. First with a right. Then a left. Wham! Wham! Okay, uh, wham! Now I'll be going wham! Now. Wham! Let's look at some of the different kinds of openings you can use. The major ones are an anecdote, a question, a direct quotation, a definition, or a description. There are other openings, but we'll focus on these five. Just like a deer hypnotized by headlights, you want your opening to make your reader unable to move until he or she finishes reading your writing. The opening gets your reader interested and lets them know what your paper is about. Now let's look at each of these types of openings a bit. First, the anecdote. An anecdotal opening is a very short story that relates to the topic of your paper. You can captivate your reader and make them want to read more of your writing. For example, Nathan might relate a powerful story about someone who was excluded in high school, leading him or her to some dramatic action. <laughs> oh my God, Terry, you're so handsome. Using a question is another way to force your reader to get involved in your paper. It's hard not to at least think about a question when it's posed to you, right? Here's a good way to use a question. Ask your readers a question, then don't give them an answer right away. If you dangle that carrot in front of your reader, then you'll make them want to keep reading for an answer. It drives them crazy! Nathan might ask something like, ever wonder what clique you fit into in high school? Or some other such question. I was a dork. A third type of opening is a direct quotation. A well-chosen direct quotation of someone else's words shows your reader that you've researched your subject well and can make your reader think about your topic in a new way. It'll make your reader want to read on to see what you have to say about that quote. Nathan might pick a quote from a movie about cliques in high school or a psychologist commenting on adolescent behavior. So we've looked at opening with an anecdote, a question, and a direct quotation. Now let's check out opening with a definition. Beginning your paper with a definition can also be effective. Sometimes you may have to begin with a definition because your reader may be unsure of your topic or how you're approaching it. Nathan could start off with a definition of clicks. Now let's look at the last type of opening we're going to cover opening with a description. Like an anecdote, opening with a description of a place, a person, or an object can pique your reader's imagination. It can take them into your writing and make them want to read on. Nathan could open his paper with a description of what it's like to be walking down the hallways of a high school. It was a dark and stormy night. The hallways of the high school were quiet, but I could smell the remains of the cliques. Regardless of how you begin your paper, just remember that you want your opening to introduce the focus of your paper. And above all, your readers should wish their limbs severed by horses rather than not be able to keep reading your paper.
Let's go back to Nathan's opening. Nathan's opening does introduce the topic of his paper, high school groups. But unless you're interested in a topic, it gives you no reason to read on. You want your opening to grab your reader's attention. It should be very specific with vivid and engaging language. Have you decided what type of opening you're going to use? Yeah, I think description. Uh, but I'm going to combine description with humor. I think humor, when humorous, uh, can be very funny. When Nathan goes back and revises his paper, here's what he comes up with. This new opening is on paper number two of your insert cards. Why don't you take a sec to read it right now? Groups. They're the cornerstone of social order. From the caste systems of India to the terrifying pecking order in federal prison, separation through grouping manifests itself in countless arenas. Nathan will probably want to continue to refine his opening, but his new revision is more vivid. Instead of saying groups are everywhere, he uses from the caste systems of India to the terrifying pecking order in federal prison. This says basically the same thing as his last opening, but it's more specific and offers two contrasting images in the reader's mind. Well, I was reading his paper, he was reading mine, but his comments weren't quite as helpful. Let's look at Sam's next comments at the bottom of the first paragraph in paper numero uno. Nathan's last sentence of the first paragraph is, students in public high school can be broken down into three general groups and into a number of subgroups. Sam is unsure if this is his thesis statement and thinks the sentence is too general. This is around the area where the thesis statement would appear in a paper. Having the thesis statement between the opening and before the supporting paragraphs is often a good segue into the rest of your paper. It doesn't have to be here, but it should be placed early in your paper. You see, in academic papers, your readers will expect you to get to the point quickly. This isn't always true in other cultures or other types of writing, but in academic essays, you got to cut to the chase. Now, let's go back to this last sentence of the first paragraph. Sam thinks Nathan's sentence is too general for a thesis statement. As we said earlier, the thesis should be specific and convincing. It should reflect the aim of the paper. This last sentence does express what he's going to do in his paper. He'll describe the different groups in high school, but he doesn't say what groups he'll break them into. And he doesn't state his position or opinion of high school groups. He needs to make this statement more focused. My paper is going to be dividing high school students into several groups, so I decided to state each of the high school groups in my thesis statement. Well, actually, Sam suggested that. She's very helpful. Oh, thanks, love. <laughs> we, uh, went to the movies last night. So Nathan needs to make his thesis statement more specific. His paper will be dividing students in high school into several groups. So he decides to state each of the high school groups in his thesis statement. That way, his reader will know that the supporting paragraphs in his paper will describe these different groups. The statement now reads, students in public high school can be broken down into three general groups, the popular kids, the nerds, and the people in the middle. These groups, once defined, can then be broken down into a number of subgroups. He's now specified what groups high school is made up of. It's more focused now. This is Nathan's new working thesis. <laughs> We've said it before and we'll say it again. Your thesis statement will probably change a lot as you write and rewrite your paper. Let's go on to the second paragraph in his paper. The second paragraph of his first draft describes the group in the middle. They scoff at the occasional superficiality of the popular people, but still envy them. They feel sympathy for the nerds, but lack the social confidence to befriend them, fearful that they too will be mired in the lowest social group. Sam comments that she likes his description of this group, but thinks it's in the wrong place. Nathan's paper hasn't defined who the nerds or popular kids are yet. His organization doesn't follow in a logical way from point to point. So Nathan decides he'll put this paragraph last after he's already defined the other two groups. But overall, his organization is strong because of his pre-writing. 
all move to the next paragraph of paper number one. The first couple sentences are, the popular kids are the ones at the top of the social food chain. They're lucky. They have all the perks. Sam comments that maybe he could say more about the popular kids. In other words, Nathan could define this group more so his readers know exactly who the popular kids are. Nathan hasn't described the popular kids enough. He thought everyone knew what a popular kid was. This is a good example of how getting feedback can help you see your blind spots. So, Nathan elaborates on his description of the popular kids. He also decides to change the name of the popular kids to the Coolies. Nathan's revised paper now reads, the Coolies are the group at the top of the social food chain. They're the popular ones. They lead charmed lives. They have all the perks. The Coolies can be divided into three basic categories, the jocks, the lookers, and the smart Alex. The major change he's made here is that he's listed the three major groups that make up the popular kids. This serves as a signpost to his reader. The reader can expect that in the next few paragraphs, Nathan will describe these three groups that make up the popular kids. Okay, let's go back to the third paragraph of paper number one, where Nathan describes jocks. Remember to pause or rewind the tape at any time if you need to reread parts of Nathan's paper. These sentences state, Jocks are easy to spot because they have obvious characteristics. First, they play sports. It's almost impossible to be a jock and not play a sport. Then the rest of the paragraph continues to describe jocks some more. Sam's confused because she's not sure if jocks and popular kids are the same thing. She's confused because Nathan's original thesis statement in paper number one is so vague. His thesis statement didn't state the different groups. It wasn't specific enough so his reader is having problems following his train of thought. She doesn't know what groups he's referring to. It's also confusing because there's not enough description of who the popular kids represent, and there's no transition between the description of popular kids and the section on jocks. We know that jocks are one of the types of popular kids because we've seen Nathan's previous outlines and free rights, but you can't tell that from the way it's written. The sentence beginning with jocks should start a new paragraph, that way, the reader would know that a new idea is beginning. Let's look at the next paragraph. Sam likes Nathan's use of the term lookers for the attractive group. It shows he's making a personal interpretation of these groups, and it's humorous. Humor, when used right, is always an effective way to sway your audience to your side of things. Humor that angers people will get you nowhere. That's why it's important to know your audience and get feedback. That way, you can see if your humor works on them. Sam's next comment is at the beginning of the sixth paragraph in his original paper. Sam marks that his first sentence at the beginning of the nerd section is too general. Nathan wrote, nerds can be broken down into three subgroups as well. The rest of the paragraph describes what a nerd is. So this sentence neither states the types of nerds nor introduces to the reader the descriptions to follow. Nathan goes back and rewrites his opening sentence to make it more specific. Here's what it looks like. Nerds are the group at the opposite end of the social spectrum from the coolies and can be broken down into three subgroups, the SUPs, the OAs, and the JPCs. This new sentence does two things. First, it connects the group to come, the nerds, with the group that just ended, the popular kids, by saying that nerds are at the opposite end of the social spectrum. So the reader can expect that the description of the nerds will be the opposite of the popular kids. This sentence also introduces the different nerd groups. That way, like the section on the popular kids, the reader knows what to expect in the next few paragraphs. This new sentence is a good example of a signpost for your reader. Wait! <laughs> now back the truck up! What's a signpost again? Remember, a signpost is a sentence used as a signal for your reader to tell them what's to come in the next paragraph. Sentences such as these are known as transition sentences. Let's look at an example in Nathan's paper where Sam has marked that Nathan needs a transition sentence. Sam writes at the end of the seventh paragraph, or the socially uncomfortable person section, that Nathan needs a transition into his next section on the overzealous academe. He's ended one social group and is about to begin another. In order to keep his reader from stumbling between sections, he needs a transition sentence. Transitions are very important, especially in long papers. They connect for your reader the many ideas that come up in a long paper. 
Even though all your ideas in your paper may be related to one another, it may not be obvious to your reader how they connect. Some readers are no better than cattle with short attention spans. You have to spell things out for them. That's why you need transition sentences. Transition sentences show your reader how what you just said relates to what you're about to say. There are some key words generally used in transition sentences that are effective in connecting ideas. <laughs> what kind of transition words you use will depend on the type of writing you're doing. You might be connecting sentences and paragraphs in a chronological way by their spatial connections, comparing and contrasting or summarizing ideas, as well as giving examples or illustrations and showing cause and effect. This is all well and good, but I need words I can use. Words! Well, if you're using a chronological relationship between ideas, you might use words like before, then, meanwhile, during, or finally. For a spatial relationship, you could use above, below, behind, or next to. For a compare and contrast paper, you could use on the contrary, however, nevertheless, similarly, or in the same way. For summarizing ideas, you would use in conclusion or therefore. When giving examples, phrases like, for instance, in addition, or specifically work well. And for cause and effect, transition words like hence, because, or thus are good. This is not an exhaustive list, but it gives you an idea of some key words available to you if you're having trouble linking your thoughts. Remember, transition sentences bridge ideas in your essay. Let's go back to paper number one and create a transition between his paragraphs. The last sentence of the sixth paragraph gives an example of the socially uncomfortable person. The next paragraph begins with the section on the overzealous academe. It begins, the OA is another nerd subgroup. So we need a sentence that shows we're leaving one nerd group and going on to another. The sentence should also show how these two groups connect, how they're related to one another. In previous transitions, Nathan has connected groups by their social standing in high school. This could be an effective way to bond these two groups, so Nathan adds an additional sentence to the end of the last paragraph. Though life might be somewhat difficult for the SUP, the difficulty the OA undergoes day to day is far more severe. So now there's a much smoother transition between paragraphs, and he showed how these two groups relate. The reader knows how these two groups are connected and what to expect in the next paragraph. Sam's last comment is about Nathan's conclusion. The conclusion, like the rest of the paper, will be continually reworked as you do several drafts. We're not going to talk about his conclusion just yet. As Nathan alters his thesis statement, introduction, and everything else, he'll need to change his conclusion. So we're going to wait until the rest of his paper is more definite before we discuss the elements of a good conclusion. So Nathan's gotten some feedback from a classmate. We've looked at some of her comments. He received some good feedback because he took the time to ask good questions. In looking at Nathan's paper, we discussed what makes a good introduction. It must be specific, reflect the focus of your paper, and make your reader want to read on. We also looked at transition sentences. Transition sentences serve as signposts to your reader so that he or she knows where you're going and where you've been. They connect an idea in one paragraph to the idea in the next paragraph. Nathan also reworked his thesis statement and organization some, and will keep on doing so.